If you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to attempt to move quicker than I usually do, with a little more um, rapidness. Well, it might not seem like it, but I am trying. It's all wonderful, and it's great to hear Jesus. So in this Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9, uh, we're going to look at 10, 10 miracles. Other things are going to happen as well, but 10 miracles and uh, not all in chronological order necessarily here, but uh, that were chosen by Matthew. Could have, could have chose, you know, volumes could be written over all the miracles that Jesus did and the signs that he did. But he picks out in these two chapters ten things, uh, miracles that he wants to marquee. And they all have a purpose here as to the power and authority of Jesus and Israel needed to see that power and authority as a demonstration of who he was as the Messiah and King. He was testifying to them that um, there's nobody else who could do what I'm doing. I have come from the Father, and I am your Lord, your Messiah, and your King. And now all you need to do is turn your heart to me and believe on me. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this testimony, and we know that primarily uh, the purpose was to get Israel to turn to their king and their savior, and um, that's what they should have done, but they didn't. But Lord, for us even today, as we read through these miracles, we see that there's never been anybody on this earth like your son. We don't have any books to read about power and authority and miracles and all of it like your son did. And so thank you for that testimony and uh, all the things that it reminds us of that as we've submitted to your authority and so glad to do so. Would you bless our time together tonight? Fill us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit and uh, work and minister in us, we pray. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So... In uh, Matthew 1 through 4, we, we learn the principles of the king, um, who he is, why he's come, all of that. And now, in, uh, in we just finished Matthew 5 through 7, we saw the, the um, excuse me, we saw the person of the king in Matthew's uh, chapters 1 through 4, who he was. Um, in Matthew's, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, we saw the principles of the king, the kingdom of heaven and the righteousness of God is, again, beyond man, beyond the Pharisees, and uh, he spoke as one who had authority. And now we get to see that power and authority demonstrated. Uh, so we'll look at the power of the king, and that's what chapters 8 and 9 are. We mentioned that there are 10 miracles that were uh, what were done here. One of the interesting things is to note is that not one of the miracles that Jesus performed um, in his entire lifetime, uh, none of them were done outside of Israel. So there was a whole world that was living out there who were sick and and uh, needing of these miracles and physical healings and all of that and. Um, but Jesus came, again, it could only be in one place at one time to testify of who he was. But in this chapter, we're going to see that he refers to all of the nations coming to him, and they will. And of course, in history, we saw that, uh, that um, more people have come to know Jesus from the Gentile world than uh, Israel, um, many times over those who were Jewish that have come to know Jesus. So, but this testimony was that they had received their king, the kingdom was at hand, and they needed to repent and turn uh, to him. So, of all the miracles that Jesus did, the most of the miracles that he did were done in the Galilee region. So, the northern region, we've already mentioned that. That's where he, a lot of his ministry time was spent. It was really the working class. It was out of the you know, uh, area of Jerusalem there where a lot of the religious, the powerful, all of that were located. And Jesus even avoids that 
area for a long time because we know they're plotting to kill him. And, uh, but he's done all of these miracles and he's going to hold them accountable for all that they, they get to see in the demonstration of the power of Jesus. Now, before we get into the 10 miracles, let me say this. I don't know if you've ever seen God do a miracle. It's pretty aw- awesome. And, and it, obviously it's supernatural. God still does miracles. And he even heals and he, and he brings forth healings. And, uh, and we should believe the Lord for that. Um, but can you imagine, and I want you to imagine as we walk through this, I want you to be in the crowd, okay? And I just want you to think of what's happening as we read it. And if you were there to witness uh, these people receiving their healings and their deliverance and how awesome, incredible that would be. And uh, that is the power of the testimony that Jesus was bringing to this multitude and it should make us weep and cry. I mean, that's probably what we would do if we, if we uh, saw the blind eye, uh, eyes opened and those who have been crippled for their entire life set free and, and, and walking. That's nothing compared to what God is doing on the inside. He's taking people away from eternal damnation and he's bringing them into personal relationship with him and eternal life. And uh, if we could really see that, then I think we would be even more impressed with the power uh, of the Lord. And so um, he's demonstrating this power. Number one, miracle number one is the leper. So verse one, chapter eight. When Jesus came down from the mountain, what mountain? Well, he was just up on the mountain, wasn't he? And he was giving the sermon on the mount. So we kind of think, oh, he's coming down from you know, half dome, you know, this big huge mountain, he's making his way down the trail. No, uh, he's up on the mountain side. Mountain, it means tell in uh, the Greek here, which just means hill, or in the Hebrew, it means tell. And uh, so, you know, up on the mountain side, and he walks down again toward the multitude. And it says, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him. Now picture that. All these people going about their business in their lives and this, this strange, you know, looking individual. You know a leper when you see them by their looks there. And he, you know, comes up to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He's coming up to a man who he's just heard talk about the authority and coming from God and all that he was. And he comes up to him and he kneels down before him and he says, if you desire it, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him. You don't touch a leper, they're unclean. You can get leprosy by contact as well. And, um, but he didn't touch the unclean because as soon as he touched him he was whole (laughs) that's the power of the Lord and he says he touched him saying I am willing be cleansed and immediately his leprosy was cleansed can't imagine looking at a leper with all of that you know the deadness of skin and the deadness of the the disease and all of the look at it of it and then to watch his entire body just be pink and clean and fresh and new. Uh, what, what, how amazing uh, that is. And Jesus said to him, see, see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So after seeing that it's, and listening to Jesus and hearing him and watching him, this guy risked his life because He was supposed to cry out, unclean, unclean, and to come even around a multitude. But yet he made his way, and he came up, and he knelt down before the Lord. And uh, and the Lord heard him, and the Lord healed him. Now, it's interesting is the way that he talked about Jesus. He said, if you are willing, 
wait a minute, don't you mean if God is willing? I mean, if, if, if you know, he's a, a prophet or a good man or a teacher or whatever talking about God, it's, it's, you're appealing to God and for him to ask God to heal him, but he didn't. He said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And, and Jesus' response was just as amazing. He said, I am willing, be cleansed. It was a demonstration to everybody that was there of, of that Jesus possessed the power of God. He didn't appeal to the Father. He didn't call on the Father to heal him. He said, I am willing, be cleansed. Why did he do it that way? Because he wanted all of Israel to know that I am willing to cleanse you. I am willing to you know, forgive your sins. I am willing to make you whole. And what a powerful, amazing demonstration. Leprosy was incurable. Nobody had a cure for it. And it still is today. It's incurable. I mean, you can, uh, they have drugs now today that they can stop the spread of this infection, but not the damage that it does and the nerve endings. And they can't restore that damage. But immediately he was restored and, uh, and made new. Leprosy was, has a spiritual connotation to it because it dooms a person. Once they're diagnosed as a leper, you know, the priest is usually involved with it. You get the tag untouchable, untouchable, unclean. That's your name. And you um, are at that point outca an outcast from society. And uh, I don't know how many years this man had been a leper but from family and from loved ones, can you imagine the isolation, the loneliness? But not only that, a declaration of becoming a leper means you were barred from Jerusalem. You were, I mean, not just Jerusalem, but the temple and the courts of the temple. You couldn't worship the Lord uh, there at the temple. You were barred from that. And so that means you were barred from worshiping God in, this, in that corporate sense. So it was as if, you, as if you were cut off from God because you were unclean. Sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Because it's a lot like uh, uh, um, the spiritual condition. It, it represents what sin, it's an illustration of what sin is like. Sin is deeper than the skin, right? Um, it spreads, it defiles, it isolates, it eventually produces death. And that's exactly what leprosy do, uh, does. And so um, you cannot be cleansed and you cannot be healed. Uh, only God could do that. And in front of their eyes, this man was made whole. His life was completely changed. Completely changed. There are several times illustrations uh, in, the, in the Old Testament about leprosy, but they all really have to do with this same thing, a declaration on the outside by this leprosy that everybody can see um, as for what God is declaring of what's going on in the inside. So it had a connotation of being rejected by God from the Old Testament. And um, obviously that was changed because now a leper could come to Jesus and he could be made whole. So now in front of everybody's eyes, he knew that lepers could be made whole and they can be forgiven and they can be cleansed. What a whole new world that opened up as well. Uh, Miriam was again given leprosy from her rebellion against God's authority and, and of Moses. Uh, Uzziah was the other one in, in the Bible that was, um, uh, came and approached the prophet Isaiah to be uh, healed. And he did, he was, uh, oh, excuse me, no, he didn't. Um, he tried to offer incense on, on the altar um, and become a priest. He was a king in the line of David, but he tried to be his own priest. And he was struck and um, was uh, struck with leprosy by God there at the altar and then was taken out, rushed out, and spent the rest of his life full of leprosy until the day that he died. Same type of connotation. And then Gehazi uh, which was Elijah's servant who, um, after the healing of Naaman by Elijah of leprosy, which is the only, only the, 
the uh, second time in all of the Bible that somebody with leprosy was healed. Miriam, God restored, and then uh, Naaman. Gehazi uh, went after Naaman um, in the name of Elijah secretly to go get money from him for this healing because he offered him money for it. But uh, God uh, knew where he was going, and God told Elijah where he was going. And when he came back, he says, where have you been? And, uh, and then at that point, God struck him with Naaman's leprosy. So that was the connotation in the mind of Israel regarding uh, leprosy. But, um, and, and, he, and he told Gehazi, it's going to cling to you and your descendants forever. All the way down your lineage, uh, you will see leprosy. Why? Because everyone that was born a leper from Gehazi's uh, lineage uh, would know right away that this is from the curse of God. Now, didn't mean God cursed them. It just means they know this is why this is in our family because of, um, you know, uh, rebelling against God and hopefully it turned their hearts uh, to God. And uh, that's the point of it. What is the point? Faith, isn't it? This man had incredible faith. He... he he knew uh, that if anybody could do this, Jesus could do that. And uh, he knew that he could. And Jesus was looking at him and seeing his faith as well. And of course, what a great demonstration. Uh, but he tells him, don't tell anybody. Good, good luck with that. But he releases him to go to the priest because Moses had a, had a, he instituted in the law, which was really fascinating because nobody got to use it. Because nobody was healed of leprosy, but God instituted this, and um, in the book of Numbers it lists this uh, ritual that the priests were to do, because if somebody ever did come in who was a leper, and then they could see that they'd all been renewed, they could be examined, and then they would take this, you know, um, they would go through this offering uh, of cleansing, and then they were declared clean. And it's just like the offering that Jesus offered. And there's a substitute. One of the little doves would die and the other one would be released as clean and, and go away. That's what Jesus did for us. He took on our sins, didn't he? And went to the cross so that we could be cleansed and forgiven. Beautiful, wonderful uh, picture. Um, but this guy didn't obey it. He told everybody. And uh, according to Mark chapter 1, verse 45... Uh, the reason why Jesus did this is because he knew he would be constricted the more that this got out because Jerusalem was going to be watching all of this. And, and one of the things that it did, it said, um, he, this guy went to Jerusalem, told everybody what Jesus did, and it forced Jesus, it says in Mark, that to avoid the city, basically, of Jerusalem. Um, and yet crowds still traveled up to come and meet him. Verse 5 Miracle number two, the Roman centurion. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, and said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Could have been from demons, but could have been physically he was paralyzed over um, uh, something that was happening in his body. And Jesus said to him, I, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority. This guy knew something about Jesus, but what he knew about him is this, this is the guy with all the authority. He has all authority. And he recognized that because he understood authority. And he said, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and the other one, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. You know, if I say jump, they say how high, basically. Verse 10, now when Jesus heard this, he marveled. And he said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. What was interesting about the centurion is that he wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman citizen. Uh, he was a Gentile. And Jesus was making the note to saying, faith like this I haven't encountered amongst the people who should have the faith 
And the belief, like nobody else, when they are witnessing my power and my authority, and it, 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 Jesus marveled at it. He's delighted in it. He loves it when people trust him with everything that they have. And so he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This is what's going to be in heaven, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you scribes. Let me tell you who's going to be in heaven. Guys like this are going to be at heaven. You know where they're going to be at heaven doing? They're going to be out in heaven hanging out with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. From all over the earth, there'll be people there in fellowship. What separates them? Believing. They have great faith in me as Messiah and King. And they will be uh, where you say you are going to be. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not where you're going, Jesus said, if you don't believe in me and you won't trust in me and, uh, and recognize my authority as from God. Now you say, well, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? No, it's not. That's the, that's the basic part of salvation is faith that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Putting our faith in the authority of Jesus, the one who died and conquered death and rose again. And, and, and God said, I require that faith. Man knows that God is there. That man knows they're going to be uh, judged before God. But he was very frank with them to let them know is, you will perish and you will not rejoice in heaven but you're going to be in outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, do you think uh, they heard that message from Jesus? You think the multitude, the people that were there, the scribes and the Pharisees throughout the crowd were, were not listening to that? And uh, this is what this testimony, these miracles are about. And Jesus said to the centurion, go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. So he didn't have to go. Jesus could uh, speak and it would be done somewhere else. Again, that's the power of God. He spoke and the universe came into existence, right? That's the kind of power and authority we're talking about with this guy here. And this Roman centurion of all the people in the crowd, you know, he recognized that. And I think that's what happens when we hear about Jesus and we hear the testimony of Jesus and the message of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus. It calls to us. I've never heard anything like that. That's, that's a, that is amazing. That testifies to me of the love of God. And, and, and I think the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, doesn't he? And he draws us to him. But he heard and he believed and he spoke. What a great miracle. Uh, amazing miracle. Uh, question, do we forget that that's the same Jesus that we serve <laughs> and the same Holy Spirit that dwells in us? Do we understand his authority over everything in our lives and the power to intervene and do and work and all of that? I think we forget how powerful the Lord is, but if you uh, would have seen that and for that centurion to go home and to see He's well. He's perfect. Of course he is. Jesus spoke it and he said it. Jesus wanted Israel to put that kind of faith in him. So he said, go, it shall be done for you. As you have believed, just as you have believed, it is done for you. Verse uh, 14, miracle number three, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother and in law lying sick in bed with a fever. So we're still kind of rolling along here. Jesus, they're um, still in the Capernaum area as Jesus has come down from the mountain and the multitudes and all that. And that's where uh, uh, Peter lived. And so they go back to Peter's house and 
And then Jesus comes into the house and he saw that Peter's mother-in-law was lying sick in bed with a fever. And so he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and she waited on him. It doesn't even say that Jesus said anything to her. He just healed her. Now, I just thought it was interesting that there's no note of Peter asking Jesus to heal his mother-in-law. He just got done seeing a Roman centurion calling out for healing for a servant. He was willing to go and travel and find Jesus and all of it. And, and now Jesus uh, walks up and says, hey, your mother-in-law, she's sick uh, with a fever. Um, I don't know about you, but after watching that, I think I might ask the Lord to heal my mother-in-law, right? Um, even a mother-in-law, you can ask for healing, right? So he touched her, and he didn't even speak to her. But what did she do? She got up and she served him. And so she recognized who he was, and she served him. And I also don't, I don't see anywhere where the disciples were serving the Lord and taking care of him after this incredible day uh, out here with uh, the multitudes. But here's something else that's interesting, is that uh, we know by this that Peter had a wife. You don't, you don't get a mother-in-law until you get a wife, right? So he definitely had a wife. And I know for a lot of people raised in the Catholic tradition there, uh, there's so much that's left uh, um, hidden from the open scriptures here. But there's no doubt that other parts speak about Peter uh, and his wife and uh, support and all of that for him. So the Catholic Church uh, took that, twist, twisted it in an unbelievable way and uh, used him as the you know, poster child for celibacy. Um, you could have used Paul. He, he might have been a better uh, thing for that because he was either, you know, his wife had left him after he accepted Christ or he wasn't married and he said it's better if you don't marry. But they chose Peter for that and... Um, uh, it's not true. Uh, now we see multiple miracles. This isn't one of the ten miracles, but this is just an example of Jesus doing a, a volume of miracles. And it says, when evening came, so still part of the same day. Now it's evening. They brought him um, to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill that they brought. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and he carried away our diseases. Interesting section here because we know that in Isaiah chapter 53 that this goes on to explain that he's going to forgive our sins. He's going to bear our sins as well. But it also speaks about infirmities and healings and all of it. And this is, was to fulfill... This. this was the testimony, this is the Messiah. This is the one. Look at what he's doing. And that's what Jesus did. He exercised authority over demons, and he just spoke, and they left. It was amazing. And uh, angels, the angels, uh, heavenly angels, uh, move when Jesus speaks, and they do what he says. It's incredible. So it says in Isaiah 53, he uh, he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. So he was merciful to us in our infirmity and in our sorrows. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's having compassion on those that are sick and hurting. The um, Bible doesn't say he healed everyone. We know he didn't heal everyone in the world. And we know even of the ones that he healed, they got sick again and they died. So the purpose of this was not solely to say everybody should walk in divine health. Uh, otherwise, Jesus would have went around the entire earth and healed everyone. Uh, that's later in his kingdom when he comes. Uh, and I believe that will be a part of the millennial reign of Christ uh, that comes. Um, but you, you, you all, maybe you know somebody who the Lord healed and maybe you're one of them. Um, question, did you ever get sick again? Yeah, and just about everybody ends up dying from the last thing, last infirmity that, that you have as your body breaks down. He didn't come to say, I'm making supernatural bodies. He's saying is, no, I'm coming here uh, primarily to heal you and give you eternal life. 
And, and, uh, and one day I'm going to, uh, after your body it perishes, I'm going to give you a new body that won't wear out and won't be sick uh, ever again. And so Israel was looking at him um, in an interesting way. They didn't recognize that he was this one because it says, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Who's the we? We of I, uh, that Isaiah is speaking about. He's talking about Israel. Here we saw the one, you know, heal the sick and carry the sorrows and deliver people, yet we esteemed him as the one who was sick, right? And he, him as the one who was smitten and afflicted because that's the way they viewed him. And even at the cross, they, they believed that was a punishment by God and God allowed him to die because um, of um, um, him not being who he said he was. And, uh, but that wasn't true of all. Isaiah 53, the next verse says, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He wasn't crushed because God was displeased with him. He was crushed because it pleased God to bruise him and to give us forgiveness of our sins and he did it for us and they missed the whole thing didn't they um he uh, we were the ones who were afflicted and he and he did it for us so they should have uh, been watching and listening to us but they didn't and they didn't hear it verse 18 now when jesus saw a crowd around him he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea interesting why take off there's a whole multitude that's there He's going to end up, um, multitudes are kind of a, it's a mixed multitude. And a lot of people will hang around Jesus for what they can get from him. The miracles, the feedings, all of those things, but they don't want to truly uh, become a disciple of Jesus. And so uh, he knows where he's going. He says there's a crowd there. He gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. So if you've ever been to Israel, Capernaum there, other side of the sea from there is Gadara or Gadaria, and uh, that's um, the direction that they're going to be uh, to be heading. So, um, <clears throat> let's see who who follows Jesus and who really wants to follow Jesus. Uh, do you want to go this direction here? It says, then a scribe came to him and he said, "Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go." And Jesus said, well, the foxes have holes and the birds uh, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You sure? You sure you're you're ready to have nothing and not even have a bed to sleep in? Apparently not, because he didn't follow. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. (laughs) Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat and the disciples followed him. So there's a lot of people that call Jesus teacher, but not Lord. And they recognized his miracles. They recognized what he did, but, but they didn't yield their life to him as their Lord and their God. Later on, a young ruler would call him good, good teacher. Um, but when he had to give up his uh, wealth, um, he went away sorrowful because he had a lot of things And a lot of stuff. Jesus has a way to, you know, get to the bottom of it. So um, Jesus said, well, if it cost you, if it were to cost you everything, would you still follow me? And uh, again, that weeds out a lot of people and and, uh, just means I'm fully committed to the Lord. The Lord doesn't call everybody to give up everything uh, to follow him. But in the true sense, he does. Because he says, "I, I have to be... Your Lord and your Savior, I come before anything else. And if that's not who I am to you, then you are not following me. And no matter if everything is stripped away from your life, uh, uh, you will trust in me and uh, you will follow me. And uh, that is what it really means uh, to follow the Lord. And of course, the Pharisees that were around him didn't want to make any of that commitment because they love their wealth, they love the things that they got from being religious and uh, all the praise and adoration and all those things. He says, well, it's not quite that way in my ministry. Um, I don't get that kind of uh, treatment. 
mostly hatred and persecution and um, and we'll see in a moment, um, even on the boat right over, he doesn't have a bed uh, to sleep in there. He just sleeps in the boat. Um, so a lot of people make, a, you know, a statement about Jesus, but, but they haven't counted the cost. I don't think we have to understand everything, but we need to understand the one main true thing is you're my king and you're my Lord. You are God and you've died for me. And I am turning my life over to you. That's what repentance is. I'm a sinner. I deserve to be separated from you. But if you will call me, if you will receive me um, and forgive me of my sins, I'm yours. And that should stay in the bottom of our heart, all of our hearts, all of our life. doesn't mean we demonstrate uh, that imperfection or without sin. But it just means if anybody asks me, who's my Lord and my King? Jesus is my Lord and King. And he's everything, and there is nobody else but him to save. And uh, that's what faith is, and Jesus said, that's what I'm expecting. So people love, you know, this emotional thing of I'm going to follow you and all of that. But when it came right down to it, these guys didn't follow. He wasn't telling them that you should uh, hate your father. He was just saying this. Is the guy was saying, listen, I'm committed to my father, my earthly father, until he dies, and that's my commitment to my family. And then after that, I'll be released to make a commitment to you. And Jesus said, no, that's not the way it works. You commit to me and let your father, uh, you, you know, uh, your family bury your father. Well, wait till I get my inheritance. After he dies, it'll be mine. I can do what I want. No, we don't wait in life until we get to the right spot and say, well, I'll serve you then and I'll follow you then. He says, no, you can follow me now, surrender now. And, uh, and that's the way the Lord requires it. Verse 21, another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Yes, I already, uh, already covered that. Um, miracle number four. Jesus calms the storm. Verse uh, 23. I've got uh, 24 here. 23, oh. Verse 24, sorry. And behold, there arose a great storm. They already took off in verse 23. Uh, Jesus says uh, he, he got in the boat and his disciples followed him. Interesting note, there was a group that would follow him, and that was the disciples, the true disciples. And he said, we're going over to the other side. And they said, and when Jesus went to get in the boat, they followed him and they got in the boat. Uh, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea. And um, so that the boat was being covered with the waves. And these are fishermen, most of them in this boat, a lot of them. They're used to rough waves, but apparently God, uh, Jesus cranked it up to the point where they hadn't, they hadn't seen anything like this. Uh, they were scared to death, thought they were dying. If they fell in that water, they would not live. And so, but Jesus himself was asleep. <laughs> What a dichotomy. Um, who was relaxed and uh, resting? Jesus in the boat. I mean, it had to be going way up and way down and water coming over the top, but Jesus was resting. And they came to him and they woke him and they said, Lord, save us. And they called him Lord, of course. He says, we are perishing. And he said to them, again, haven't you just witnessed my authority? That I can speak to any illness, any sickness, the demons themselves, and they obey me. Um, who do you think is with you in this boat, right? Who, why are you afraid? You, you men of little faith. Again, it doesn't mean they didn't believe in him, but uh, the, regarding their faith is, is that the same thing. You need to trust me with your very life, and you can trust me with your very life. If I told you we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. And um, if, if this boat were to go down, I would go down. Do you think I'm going down? I'm not going down. I'm going to fulfill what I've been called to do. Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. If you ever been out in the Sea of Galilee, it can just get choppy really quick. Some of the storms, it gets really bad out there. But for somebody to speak and it all stops, if you've ever been in a great storm, and to have it stop in a moment, 
And not only did it stop, it looks like as it's written here that the seas stopped immediately. It wasn't like, it just kind of starts rocking and then it starts slowing down. Calm. You know, what would that do to you if you saw that? I mean, I mean, it was exactly what happened to them, right? The men were amazed, and they said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? I think they were missing something, weren't they? They didn't understand the fullness of his deity. This was God. They were looking at God, the one who created the wind and the sea. But who could speak like that and do that? Only God could do that. And uh, this awesomeness should remove fear in their life, for the rest of their life. They shouldn't be afraid of anything else. I, I know Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. What, whom shall I fear with him on my side, right? But yet that wasn't the case in their lives. I mean, humanity takes over, but even Peter was afraid he would be caught, you know, and denied the Lord three times. But what's interesting is, is something happened to them after the death of Christ it kind of shattered them. And they thought, well, wait a minute, he can't raise him. He's raised up others. He can't raise himself up. But then after the, the resurrection uh, there, and they, and they saw him, and they were never the same again. And um, we've talked about martyrs and people who are willing to die. Um, these men were more than glad to die. That fear was not there anymore. Peter just said, hey, hey, don't hang me like Jesus. Don't crucify me like Jesus. Hang me upside down. I don't deserve to die like he did. Wasn't afraid. Why, what, what can you do to me? My God conquered death and is alive and on the throne. And uh, you can't end my life. And uh, so that fear um, is driven out. We're going to be afraid in our lives until we realize that um, if the Lord has brought us into a storm, that he's with us in the storm, right? He can either calm the storm or take us through the storm, but whatever it is, we're with Jesus. He knows we're there and we're with him and fear shouldn't be a part of our life. I act like I've never been afraid. No, life gets to you and you, you have this thing, fear that seizes you in that moment. That's a good time to talk to Jesus and just to be reminded that he sees me, he knows me. If I'm afraid, it should be only because I've sinned. It's my fault. And I need to repent, um, but not because I'm following uh, the Lord. And uh, that's, that's important. So faith, that's what the Lord wanted. He wants us to trust him in his uh, perfect plan and will for our lives and uh, wants to remove from us that kind of sin. So following the Lord was a part of the lesson for these guys um, you're going to follow me? You're going to follow me into the storm? You're going to trust me that I can speak to the storm? What an amazing miracle. And um, they saw it with their own eyes. I don't think you'd ever be the same if you watched that. Verse 28, when he came to the other side, this is miracle number five, the healing of two demon-possessed men, one of my favorites in the Bible. I relate to it. Never been demon-possessed that I know of. Uh, but um, I sure... I look at this and I just see it clearly. It's one of the great ones. He said he came to the other side to the country of the Gadarenes. Um, two men were demon possessed. They met him as they were coming out of the tombs. So they were extremely violent and, and no one could pass by. So this is the uh, Matthew writes of two demons, uh, demon possessed men, but the other um, accounts of this only speak of the one. Uh, demon-possessed man. Well, there were two de demons there, but the other two, uh, they emphasized another personal thing that went on between Jesus and this, this man who was delivered of the legions. He was the one that, um, and both of them were delivered, apparent, according to this, but um, the other two focused only on the one, um, and that's the one who was, you know, again, not only delivered, but wanted to follow Jesus. So, um, that's not what he's emphasizing in this miracle, and we'll see what he is emphasizing here as we look at it. Extremely violent, and uh, people were afraid of them uh, because they were in that way a little bit on the supernatural because they were full of demons. And, and they cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? Hmm, seemed to know who he is, didn't they? 
Have you come here to torment us before our time? Obviously, this is the demons that are speaking, not the men. As we'll see, the men cried out and they came to Jesus. And that, uh, that, um, the demoniac there, he wanted to come toward Jesus. And the closer that he got toward Jesus, these demons were like, I don't want to go to Jesus. And they began to speak out because they knew Jesus knew they were there. And so... They speak uh, here, and uh, are you here to torment us before our time? And now it says, there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. And the demons began to entreat him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. Now, picture Jesus, if we could see into the spiritual realm, there's thousands of demons. And Jesus is calm. And he's going to, he said to them, Go. Did they fight him? Did they say, well, we're going to do our best to take you on and you can't make us do? Not at all. They knew he had the authority, didn't they? They didn't have any ability to resist him. And when he said go, they went. So if we could see that and watch that, even in the spiritual realm, the fallen angels and Satan himself, he has no... Um, uh, ability to trump the authority of God. He, God is, is, is their creator, the one who made them. And they came out and they went in the swine and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank and into the sea and perished uh, in the waters. First um, mention of deviled ham. So, so you know that. It's an old joke, but there you have deviled ham. Verse 33, the herdsmen ran away and they went to the city and they reported everything. People were watching, including what happened to the demoniacs, plural. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they implored him to leave them, to get out of there and to go away from them and their region. Interesting, interesting section here. Let me just look at the three parts that, that Matthew wanted to emphasize. Number one, the, de the demoniacs, of course. They were controlled by these demons, right? They, they um, were ruled. They were uh, bound by these demons in their life. Nobody could set them free. They were, they were undeliverable. They were uncontrollable uh, in the recognition there. And so men had no way to deliver them. Um, yet they believed, or they came to Jesus, they believed that and there was something in them that he had authority to remove those demons from them, from binding them and tor uh, tormenting them and taking control over them. They looked at that authority and they said, that's the one. That's the one. Would Jesus deliver people from demons? Yes, he delights in doing it. But even within that control of the demon, he could not control their faith and their uh, ability to say, I don't want any more of this. I want to be delivered. And then when they looked at Jesus, they knew he was the one. Now, number two, the demons themselves. Obviously, they knew. They knew who Jesus was in human flesh, and they knew he was the Son of God. They knew him from eternity, or all the way at the beginning of time, as their creator. And he, they knew that he had authority, complete authority, uh, authority over them, and uh, uh, he had the authority to bind them. That's interesting. They were binding these men but they knew that Jesus had the authority to bind them. In fact, they said that, is it our time when you are going to bind us? You're, you, you're going to, uh, again, put us in a place of torment, which was of their own doing. And uh, they knew that time was coming. Jesus will bind up all evil, bind up uh, all of the demo uh, demons and Satan himself, and they will put him in the place that's called the lake of fire, and that's what it was created for, for them, not for man. He doesn't want one man to go there, but uh, they will. 
So then the third uh, group is the townspeople. And of course, what did they want? They just wanted Jesus to leave. Now, if you'd known these men and you knew them by sight and you saw these guys frothing in the mouth, pulling off the chains, screaming and crying in the tombs, and this went on for you know year after year and you're afraid to even walk by there, and then you see this man there with these two men at his feet, and the Bible says in the other section that they were clothed because they were naked. They were clothed and they were in their right mind. If you watch that, to me, that's the greatest picture of what Jesus does for us. We are lost in our sin, bound, no way out of it. And, uh, and, and what it does, the effects of sin to our lives. And when you look and you see from that moment to the next moment when they were, uh, were delivered and they were forgiven, I'm assuming as well as they trusted on Jesus, and here they are. This was the guy before, and this is the guy now. We're talking about a few minutes, and a whole new life begins. That's salvation. And somebody once questioned me on that. Um, they said, "You can't. You think you could just go down to that altar, and you know, and pray and ask the Lord to forgive us, and you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna be that same person that you were." And I was like, "I don't buy that for a minute. Basically, you're still the same guy." And I just, I could not believe it. I said, well, what's, what's the hope then? Of course I believe that. And I know in my heart, Jesus gets to be my Lord and he's my king. And I believe I can be a new creation, a new person. And of course, it takes time for them to see that new guy coming out. But if, I, I mean, what use would it be for me to go down and, and to ask the Lord to forgive me and wash me and cleanse me and make me a new creation and come into me if I didn't believe he could do that? And this story reminds me of that. Because literally you get up from that altar, from that time of turning your life to the Lord. And the Bible says you're a new creation. doesn't mean I, you don't ever sin. doesn't mean you don't ever have struggles. But now he dwells with you. And you're at peace. And you're in your right mind. Because you weren't before in your lost state. Only Jesus could do that. Love that section. Now the pigs, why did he let them go into the pigs? Why did he destroy the pigs? Probably because this was a Jewish uh, group as well, and they weren't supposed to be raising pigs. It was a sin against the law of Moses to be raising pork and doing this. Of course, it reflects who they are. They didn't even want Jesus. They didn't even want to talk to him. And so um, this was a twofer in that. And now this was a strike against them for what they were doing against him. And again, their response was that, why don't you just get out of here? And uh, sickening, saddening, um, but that's, uh, that was their response to the authority and the deliverance and the power of the Lord. I want nothing of it. Would you please leave us? Um, unbelievable that, you know, two people in the same position witnessing the same thing could have so amazingly different responses. But that's what it is. It's the heart, isn't it? I mean, here, the multitude is saying, I want Jesus to be my Lord, and I, I want to follow you. Lord, I'll bow down to you. I, you're my king. You're, my, you're the Messiah. And the other guy over there is going, I'm going to kill that guy. I hate him. What a liar. Really? Miracle number six, chapter nine, one through eight. Getting into the boat, Jesus crossed over, so he's leaving again, going back, really, the same direction that he came from over the sea, and came to his own city. He was from Nazareth. This you know, obviously possibly could be Nazareth, but that's not on the other side of the lake. It's a lot farther than that. Probably Capernaum, because when Jesus um, confronted the people from Nazareth and he, he declared to them who he was, uh, they uh, rode him out of the city and tried to throw him off a cliff. So uh, at that point, he said, listen, I can't do any miracles here in this thing because you, you won't believe uh, the Bible says he went to the Galilee and that became his home. So it was probably Capernaum uh, here that Jesus went to. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed, seeing their faith. By the way, this is a shortened version of this miracle as well. Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, what did he just say? He just said to the guy, Hey, your sins are forgiven. 
And some of the scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. Only God can forgive sin. Who does he think he is? And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? What's, why is that stirring you up so much? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Which, which one of those would be easier for you guys to say? Neither, because they can't do either one. They can't forgive sins because only God can do it. And they can't heal the man of, of his sickness. And so Jesus is saying, neither one's complicated for me to say at all. I can say them both. And so he says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority uh, on earth to forgive. Because he could say, well, your sins are forgiven. But, but God didn't forgive his sins. That's just a crazy man saying, hey, your sins are forgiven. He says, well, what if I say the other thing then? And this guy gets up and walks. Do you think I have the authority to say that uh, they, his sins are forgiven? And so then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed and go home. And he got up and he went home. <laughs> Some of them were amazed. It says, and the crowds saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men or as the Son of Man. Um, but the Pharisees knew what he was saying. He was saying that he was God and he just testified by, that he has the power of God and he has the authority to do either one and they hated it and they wanted to kill him. Unbelievable. A lot to this story. Can't get into it now. We need to wrap up this uh, chapter here. But you say, well, what does sin have to do with you know, the physical healing? Well, sometimes our sin is the cause of our physical <laughs> sickness. And it's possible, paralytic, and uh, people look at the word here, a gradual paralysis that had gone on, like a palsy type of thing, um, and eventually he lost his motor skills and all of that. And some, uh, again, we have no way of knowing, said this could have been from his own lifestyle, sexual uh, deviancy and, and uh, forgetting, um, you know, at some point, uh, a venereal disease or whatever those are that hurt his own body. And, uh, but we don't know that. But um, uh, obviously he was delivered and set free. And we'll read that again in the next section uh, in the, in the uh, book of Mark and Luke as well and get the different angles of uh, what all happened here. But they were amazed. Verse 9. The calling of Matthew... And Jesus has the power to save uh, even tax collectors. And it says, Jesus went from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. And he said to him, follow me. Not a long conversation. Or at least it's not recorded as a long conversation. And he got up and he followed him. You're a tax collector. You're wealthy. You got a great job. You have power. You have authority. You probably have a lot of stuff as well. Um, wasn't a long discussion uh, Matthew saw Jesus and he said, I'm out of here, leaving it all behind. And it happened as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, which means he must have thrown a celebration there uh, for Jesus. And he had a dinner or invited all of the tax collectors and friends and everybody else to come to his house. Hey, might as well enjoy it now because I'm leaving this house and I'm going to go and I'm going to go follow Jesus. He says, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. It says, but when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? Jesus knew it. And he heard this and he said, is it not those who are healthy who need a physician? Do they need a physician? Are those that are sick need a physician? But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. Of course, these guys didn't have a clue. Because the worst sinners in, their, in, in, in the room were, they were the worst sinners in the room. They, because they didn't know they were sick. That's the worst place you could be is this false sense of who you are and and, you know, I'm all right, I'm a good guy, and, I'm, you know, I'm going to get into heaven because I'm good, and I got my own righteousness there, and, and when I stand before God, I'm going to say, look what all I've done, and 
I was a pretty good guy. Hey, wait, you, you, you missed it. If you didn't see your sin um, and, uh, you know, really who you really are, which is what happens when God convicts us, we see who we really are, the phony mask is peeled off, then, then you're in worse shape than anybody else in the room, right? So here's Matthew. He's this guy who just, you know, they hate him because he's a tax collector, but he's now a follower of Jesus, and he doesn't really care what they think of him. Um, he was rich, and he gave all that away, and he's having this big uh, meal here, and he's just thrilled to be following Jesus, and he wants those around him, the other tax collectors, Jewish tax collectors, to be saved, and anybody else who um, can find Jesus. So it's a great section here. Um, uh, love it. I uh, love to see a man just get up and say, no, I'm leaving all that behind and I'm going to follow Jesus. Verse 14, then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? Can't be unhappy. You've, you're, the bridegroom is with you. Uh, the bride can't um, mope and cry and uh, fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine in old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskin bursts, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. Um, but they put wine, new wine into fresh wine skin so it can stretch, uh, and both are preserved. Basically what he's saying to them, give you the quick version here, is that you need to stop moping around about John. And John is John the Baptist, and these were the disciples of John the Baptist. He said, listen, he's gone. He's a part of what the Old Testament was, but he was here to point to me. It's time to to stop being a disciple of John and, and being a, be the disciple of me. I'm the bridegroom, and you're the bride. Uh, you should rejoice. And so this whole idea of fasting is, is that, yes, there'll be a time when I'm going to leave you, and then you'll mourn because I will not be with you. And fasting is good, all of that. But right now, you need to stop your mourning, and you need to turn your eyes upon me and follow me. Um, the old is gone, the old covenant, and now this new covenant is right at your doorstep, and that's uh, Jesus. So, miracles 7 and 8. While he was saying the, these things to them, the synagogue official, who was Jairus, we know from Luke 4, uh, the leader of the synagogue, he came and he bowed down before him. That must have been eye-opening, leader of a synagogue. And, and he said, my daughter um, has just died but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Well, that's great faith. You can raise the dead. I believe you can raise the dead. Jesus got up and began to follow him and, and so did his disciples. And, and a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came um, up behind him and touched the frim of his, uh, uh, um, of his coat, uh, of his cloak, the fringe. And I don't, I don't she couldn't, she wasn't really allowed to touch him physically because she was unclean, right? She had this, this uh, bleeding uh, thing here uh, for the last 12 years, a woman, a woman thing. But she was saying to herself, if, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. I don't even need to touch him. I can just touch his clothes. That's a lot of faith, isn't it? But Jesus turning and seeing her, he said, daughter, basically, who, who brushed up against me? Who, who touched me? And he looked around. He said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once the woman was made well. And when Jesus came into the official's house and he saw the flute players, this is the leader of the synagogue, Jairus, and the crowd, noisy, they're all yelling and trying to grieve and wail for the dead. He said, uh, leave, for the girl has not died, but she's asleep. And that's what we're called as we're, as we're become believers. We're not going to die. We're just going to go to sleep. We won't go to sleep, but our bodies will go to sleep, and the Lord's going to wake them up and give us new bodies, right? Change them. And they began laughing at him. She's not asleep. She's dead. But when the crowd had uh, been sent out, he ordered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And uh, did Jesus touch, touch a dead body? 
That would make him unclean. No, because when he touched her, she was made alive. And so this bothered them as well. And this news spread throughout all the land. You're going to be angry at uh, uh, Jesus for touching a dead body, but that body was raised up. So why are you angry? Why does that make you angry? Uh, He gave her life. So, but when the crowd had been sent out, he ordered and he took her by the hand and she got up, verse 26, the news spread, verse 27, and uh, miracle number nine. And Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. By the way, they knew he was the Messiah. And they, when they saw him, they knew this was the son of David who was the savior of Israel because that's uh, the prophecies uh, said that The son of David will be the king and the Messiah. So when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, yes, Lord. And when he touched their eyes saying, it shall be done to you according to your faith. What does he mean by that? Who do you believe that I am? It's according to that, that you will be healed. And they believed he was the Messiah and Savior who could heal him. And that's the kind of faith uh, that Jesus was looking for. Uh, and their eyes were open, and Jesus, again, sternly warned them, see that no, no one knows about this, but they went out and spread the news about him throughout all the land. He's trying to, to get them to uh, keep things down a little bit so that he could have that freedom Uh, to move around. But the more that he did and the more testimony of it, the more angry that the leaders got. Let's wrap this up here. Um, As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. And after the demon was cast out, very unique, he was demon-possessed and the demons kept him mute. The mute man, after the demons were cast out, the mute man spoke and the crowds were amazed and were saying, nothing like this has ever happened are been seen in Israel, but the Pharisees were saying he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. So basically, they are the picture of the mute because the demons have, they, they can't even speak the truth. But as they look at all these miracles, they can only come to two different conclusions. When you read about Jesus, you know, some people say he's a Lord, liar, or a lunatic, right? But In the simplest form, nobody else can do these things. So either it has to be God, right? Or um, um, a lunatic, crazy man, a liar, a deceiver, a blasphemer. But the Pharisees came up with one more because they knew he... um, um, wasn't going to be received as a liar and a lunatic because he was doing the things that he said he could do. And he has to be God or he could be Satan. So they attributed the works of God to Satan and they said he's doing this by the power of Satan. He's Satan incarnate. And this was so grievous that basically this is where the Lord said, that's blasphemy. There's no returning from that. That's the unpardonable sin. Uh, in doing that, saying not only is Jesus not God, he's, he's the devil, he's Satan. And when Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. And that's why he was there. Because they were distressed and dis, um, dispirited like sheep without a shepherd and And uh, that's what they were. They were lost and they needed somebody to save them. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And next week we'll see that he's going to send them out in his name. Let's pray. Lord, there's nothing that you can't do. There's no uh, hopeless situation that you can't deliver man out of. You can do anything. You can save a demon-possessed man. You can deliver a leper. You can heal a, a completely shut down, broken body. You can raise that body from the dead. You have authority over everything. You can speak to you know, the, the angels of heaven and they obey you. 
Uh, Lord, um, remind us that that's who you are. You're our Lord and our Savior, and you're our God. And we thank you, Father, for your power to do that. Now the world needs to hear that. And we talk about being sent out, but Lord, um, they need to be delivered. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And uh, Lord, would you give us eyes to see that and have compassion like Jesus had compassion on the multitude. Increase my compassion, compassion tonight. Not to look down on the lost and those that reject you, but to love them and to have compassion on them. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.